from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. Coming up on Ag Day, could the 2018 hurricane season bring less of a bite to farmers? We'll have a new forecast. Still recovering from the 2017 hurricane season, meet a Texas cotton grower who brings optimism to the field. In agribusiness, looking at the week ahead. You can't expect the market to go up all the, every day. Machinery Pete checks his ledger for trends on older used tractors and celebrating the power of dairy all this month. Ag Day, brought to you by the Chevy Silverado, the most dependable, longest lasting full size pickups on the road. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. As cotton futures dance near a dollar a pound, cotton growers are hopeful for a profitable year. But with the uncertainty of hurricane season, farmers know how quickly those hopes can be dashed. Friday marked the official start of the hurricane season, and there are varying opinions on how many hurricanes we could face. NOAA is forecasting five to nine hurricanes in the Atlantic, but just last week, Colorado State University forecasters lowered its outlook, now expecting six hurricanes down from seven in their April forecast. The adjustment is due in part to colder waters in the tropical Atlantic. Still, you're encouraged to be vigilant. There certainly are still many reminders of last year's uh, historic devastation. So I want to take a minute to say that we at FEMA and in the federal government uh, continue all recovery efforts uh, related to Harvey, Irma and Maria. Those three major hurricanes created combined losses of $215 billion. Hurricane Harvey slammed into the coastal bend of southeast Texas last August on its way to Houston, where it dumped rainfall measured in feet. But on its way there, the storm devastated a cotton crop that was called the crop of a lifetime for many growers. Unharvested fields were swamped, and those lucky enough to harvest before the storm hit were left with saturated bales and modules. In this video, provided by the Texas Farm Bureau, Ed Wolf returns to the region where faith is strong for a big recovery. Every cotton plant equals hope along the Texas coast. A new beginning, a way forward. Remnants of Hurricane Harvey are still visible, Ruined cotton modules line Daniel Gravanovic's fields. They stand as a stark reminder of last year's devastation. The best crop in years, gone with a storm. But farmers on the coastal bend are not focused on the past. They're striving for the future. Last year has nothing to do with this year. You have to move on from the past and go with the new. Daniel farms near Wharton with his dad, F.D. His family has been farming along the coastal bend for three generations. They grow other crops, but cotton's become their mainstay. It was just nine months ago Harvey rained down sorrow and destruction on Texas, but the green stalks emerging from this coastal soil are a testimony of tenacity, the grit to never give up. We didn't get the wind, like say Rockport area and so on, but we did have a lot of rain. But then later we had a flooding that came three or four days after. That's really what affected our area. 20 plus inches of rain were almost bearable until the deluge of water Harvey dumped upstream started overflowing the banks of area rivers. The Colorado and the Bernard rivers met and became one huge swath of water, flooding Daniel's fields up to two and a half feet deep. Some of his cotton was harvested, some waiting to be picked up by the gin, and some went underwater. But now those once flooded fields have given way to new life, rows of young cotton plants reaching for the sky, determined to survive where destruction once reigned. A vivid picture of the spirit of Texas coastal farmers. Been farming all my life, that's what farmers do. You don't back up just cause one is bad. We don't always have a good year. We have, we have more bad ones than good ones. So you just gotta go back again. That's all you can do. The epicenter of the historic hurricane hit near Rockport. Bayside Richardson Co-op Gin was one of the casualties of the category four storm. Over 100 mile an hour winds tore off almost half the roof, destroying two of the walls, a warehouse, a seed house, and much more. Rain poured inside the exposed gin. Outside a sea of ruined cotton covered the module yard. I started trying to figure out where do we go from here? How do I get this best cleaned up and put back together to finish the crop we had already harvested? The more we looked, the more damage we found and, and realized that it just wasn't gonna be feasible to, to get it back up and running. David found other local gins ready to help finish ginning the salvageable cotton. Then he immediately got to work. Within days, crews were on site rebuilding. Nine months of almost round the clock work later, and they're just about ready for this year's harvest. We'll definitely be ready. As I told people before, I said in our industry, not being ready is not an option. 
it's what we do in agriculture. Next year is always the year we're looking for to get us over the hump, to get us back on top. We weren't going to let the stumbling block shut us down. Hurricane Harvey knocked agriculture down, but farmers are stronger than the storms of life. They don't stay down. It's not in their nature. They get back up, move forward, determined to keep going with faith and a growing hope. With the Texas Farm Bureau, Ed Wolf, Bayside. Texas A&M economists estimated Texas cotton losses at $100 million from Hurricane Harvey. Livestock losses hit $93 million. Meanwhile, starting today, USDA is accepting applications for disaster assistance under the Livestock Indemnity Program, or LIP, and the Emergency Assistance for Livestock, Honeybees, and Farm-Raised Fish Programs. Now, the Farm Service Agencies reopened the application period because of statutory changes made by Congress. These applications cover losses in calendar year 2017 or 2018. FSA says if you already submitted an application, you do not need to reapply unless there were additional losses after the original cutoff date. Trade tensions are continuing this morning with the EU, Canada, and Mexico. Those countries saying they're putting retaliatory tariffs on U.S. products if the administration continues with its plan to not exempt those countries from steel and aluminum tariffs. Some groups saying farmers will be the ones hurt the most here at home. You know, if you're a farmer who's seeing the cost of steel go up, so your grain bin is more expensive, or you're seeing the, the price of your commodity go down, you can't export the product you want, or you're seeing a contract canceled if you do direct contracting, these are real impacts. And for farmers who are already suffering from low commodity prices, that can make the difference between staying in business and going out of business. Keel says tariffs prohibit access to different markets, access a producer's need. Meteorologist David Harker with Ag Day affiliate WNDU is in for Mike Hoffman today and he has today's crop comments. Good morning, David. Good morning, Clinton. We've received this photo from Megan Schlaker of Austin, Minnesota. Now we chose her photo of storm clouds rolling in for our Facebook cover photo this month. She says her area of southern Minnesota has been wet and they're still trying to plant. They would gladly share the moisture with those who need it. And this picture is post storm in Jefferson County, Illinois. Now it comes from Montesanto's Southern Illinois Technology Development Team on Twitter. Severe storms late last week causing green snap of that young corn. Now agronomists say corn is growing rapidly and they'll need a couple days to know the full extent of this damage. That is so hard to see and we know that more rain is needed in some locations of the United States. Take a look at the weather map. The drought monitor showing it's still pretty nasty out west. We had seen some relief out east due to Alberto, which moved through last week. We'll have more details in the forecast coming up. But now, here are some hometown temps. Deciding whether to sell your old equipment? Well, Machinery Pete's Pick of the Week lets you stay informed on current market prices, allowing you to set the best possible price for your equipment. Text Pete6 to 31313 to get started. When we come back, we'll head over to the Agribusiness Desk for a discussion about the marketing week ahead with our panel of experts. Plus, Machinery Pete is here. Big dollars are flowing towards nice, original condition tractors. Stick around, folks, and we'll discuss. In agribusiness, it was an up and down close to the Marketing Week Friday. Let's see where things ended up on the floor of the scene in Chicago. Talking about July wheat, down a little bit today, capping off a very volatile week. 28 cent, cent range from high to low with gigantic moves up on Monday and back down on Wednesday. Five days down 4%, struggling to hold on to a 14% year to date uh, gain. The drivers in wheat, uh, the same as they were this time last week, and that is supplies remain very comfortable. Weather in Russia is something people are looking at but not too worried about. Dollar strength, and farmers are selling every rally. Going forward, the question will be that uh, what, what will break wheat to this new uh, level being up 14% on the year? Will it hold, or will uh, a dollar or a Russian ruble or some other factor change the market scenario? I'm Larry Shover from the CME Group in Chicago. Here at the Agribusiness Desk, we have Bob Utterback, Utterback Marketing, and Mark Fight with International Agribusiness Group. Mark, let's start with you. What did you learn last week that you thought, boy, that, that could impact us as we move forward through June? Well, I think 
you had to, uh, what we learned last week was you can't expect the market to go up all the, every day. Okay. And this is our first test as a, 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 a test for the bulls and test for the farmers. And they have to understand that, that the next rally could be the last. Yeah. And Bob, as you watched uh, last week, what'd you learn? I thought I was, the corn market was responsibly strong in light of how good the crop actually looks. Mm -hmm. And so it tells me that there's something underneath this market. And, and when you talk to a lot of people in the trade, I think there's a ton of buying orders in December between 405 and 395. I think there's a very strong interest to own at that level. So I think it's going to be difficult to get December corn below the 408, 405 level. Okay, as we move forward, Mark, um, into this week and into June, are there some key indicators you're going to be watching in the next few, few days or weeks? Our focus is weather, and it's U.S., it's Europe, Western Europe, it's Eastern Europe. Uh, the two areas that, that are critical today are, are U.S. and Black Sea. Black okay. Sea is right in the throes of a, of a relatively mild drought. We're going to hurt the wheat crop if they don't get rain in the next three weeks. We're going to hurt corn further down the road. U.S. crop looks good. Yeah. Got to keep raining. All right. What about you, Bob? I think it's exactly that weather outlook and in dovetail with the June supply demand report, does USDA back off their very high numbers on carryover number and show, reflect what the trades more tighter global stock use ratio figures. And after that, if they do the adjustment, if the market can't rally, then that does tell you that the highs are in for, we go through the whole process again. We gotta be prepared for the set July to October seasonal correction time period. All right, well, it's been kind of a fun couple of weeks. We'll keep an eye on it and see where it takes us. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. We'll be back with more Ag Day. Just a minute. To talk to Mark, give him a call at 248-715-9222 or send him an email at mfight at iaggroup.com. To talk with Bob one-on-one, -on -one, call Utterback Marketing Services, toll-free at 800-832-1488. David Harker in for meteorologist Mike Hoffman today. David, as we look at the drought monitor here, you can really focus in on where the problems lie. And some places have seen improvement, though. Oh, they sure have. And in fact, most of it's along the eastern seaboard. And take a look at the southeast. A lot of heavy rain showers down that way, but we do need relief out west. A lot of that moisture that we're seeing from the southeast is the cause from Alberto from last week. And notice how there's just big areas of yellows and reds. I mean, we're talking two, three, five inches of rain that made its way through and even up through the Great Lakes where Alberto finally made its way out. We do have some of those showers, a little relief there in the northern plain states. But some areas, as we've mentioned, are still dry. That's out west, so we'll be watching for that. And boy, it's just going to be more nasty as we get to the Atlantic hurricane season, which, by the way, began on Friday. So that means, obviously, more moisture for some portions of the United States. Let's take a look at the jet stream, say how we're going to fare through the day ahead. We've got a dip in the jet stream, meaning uh, some more precipitation, cooler weather up in the northern plain states, the northeast to be exact. We've got the ridge of high pressure, meaning nice and dry, unfortunately. That's going to only uh, make that drought even more worse there in the southern Plain States, Texas, as well as New Mexico, Arizona. A little bit of rain is in the forecast, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Now, we, as we advance later on in the week, you'll notice a big ridge in the upper uh, portions of the atmosphere. This will allow the drier to persist. Not good for the folks who need the shower. So let's take a look at the uh, temperatures this week. A lot of the United States likely to be above normal and that big bullseye or while well, the extreme heat is going to be sitting right over the central plains. If you're along the eastern seaboard down through uh, the Carolinas as well as Georgia and Florida, you're likely below normal on the temperature side of things. Precipitation wise, a little bit of relief from the rain showers across the Midwest as well as the southern plain states. A little bit of rain showers there. The monsoonal season beginning up there in the four corners region of the United States. Now, when we talk 30 days out, not much of a change when we talk temperatures. In fact, not really anywhere in the continental United States are we actually seeing below normal temperatures. So, I mean, when you start thinking of all this heat, that's just not going to do all that well. But we could use a little moisture. Unfortunately, it doesn't come in the places that we need it. You'll notice there on the screen that the above normal rainfall areas along the eastern seaboard, up in the northern plain states, the Dakotas, we've got the uh, drought continuing off in the west and the northwest, as well as in areas like Oklahoma and Texas. Unfortunately, places that just 
don't need it, could use a little extra relief from Mother Nature. We hope even 90 days out we finally get there. It's just a matter of time before we actually see it. So we're going to watch this very carefully and we hope that you will too. So let's get right into our forecast for Caldwell, Idaho. We're talking bright sunshine, high temperatures near 80 degrees, low of 57. 87 degrees as we look to Conway, Arkansas with some clouds still hot and looks like rain showers in Massachusetts there in Pittsfield with a high of 55. Machinery Pete joins us next with some incredible auction examples of strong prices for older original tractors and later grab a slice, take a dip, drink a glass. June is dairy month and Wisconsin is celebrating. Always a purveyor of price trends, our own Machinery Pete is keeping a close watch on older, all original used tractors. Here's Craig. Well folks, one trend I've really seen here the last year or two is bigger dollars flowing towards nice condition original tractors. Now probably one of the most extreme examples of this was just a couple weeks ago on an online collector auction in Red Cloud, Nebraska, sailed by my friends at Almond Vintage Power. Now, one of the lead tractors on the sale was this beautiful 1955 John Deere 60, all original, amazingly only had 1,122 hours on it. Now, Kurt Ahman told me the story on this thing was that it was bought new back in 55 and used in 55 and 56, but then just shedded until 1992, and again, all original. Now, how much did it go for? It brought $25,725. Now that is the highest auction price I've ever seen on a John Deere 60 that was not either a high crop or a rare LP standard. And again, the originalness was the key there. Now another extreme example, about a year ago, this 1979 John Deere 4440 power shift with 10,312 hours on it, and you can see how nice it is, sold on a Tracy Schumacher farm auction in south, southwest North Dakota and it went for $38,000. Again, original condition, beautiful. And that's the second highest auction price I've seen on a 4440 the last five years that did not have a loader with it. When we come back, celebrating Dairy Month in the Dairy State. We're off to Wisconsin next. Ag Day, brought to you by Top Third Ag Marketing. Farmer first with a plan for every market. In the Country, sponsored by Kubota. Tractors, hay tools, utility vehicles, mowers, and more. Visit KubotaUSA.com today. Friday was National Donut Day, one of my favorites. It's also National Dairy Month, and in Wisconsin, that's reason to celebrate. The Wisconsin Dairy News says there are plenty of ways to see the economic impact of dairy and enjoy some Wisconsin cheese. Dairy Month celebrations are underway. To celebrate Wisconsin's dairy industry, consumers can attend cheese and butter festivals, county fairs, and of course, dairy farm breakfasts. The best part about going to these June dairy breakfasts or brunch is being able to meet your local farmer, being able to talk to them, learn more about their farm, and how they contribute to Wisconsin's economy and their local community. June is a hectic month for Alice in Dairyland, who is busy all month long attending events to share the $43.4 billion impact the dairy industry has on our state's economy. So whether it's going to various festivals across the state to celebrate butter to even deep fried cheese curds, it's a great time for families to understand where their dairy products come from. June is a time not only to acknowledge the dairy industry in our state, but to really highlight all the different products it offers. We are a top cheese producing state, um, known for our, our quality specialty cheeses, uh, but that's just only the beginning. And so it, if it employs one out of nine people in our state. While consumers may enjoy exceptional dairy products year round, it's also important during the month of June to highlight the value of the dairy industry within our local communities. We continue to have a strong dairy industry uh, but that doesn't just happen. That happens because we've created an environment where our farmers can, can, can prosper. Um, obviously, it's challenging times right now, but we want to continue to, to recognize the great job they're doing and look at how we can, through policies, continue to, to maintain a strong dairy industry, all the way from the farm to the processor to the consumer. And that's Wisconsin Dairy News. 
And that's going to wrap us up for this Monday morning. But before we go, don't forget about the all new AgriTalk app now available on iOS and Android. It features live streams and archived episodes of AgriTalk and AgriTalk After the Bell with Chip Flory. You can also find my very own Farm Sense podcast, a weekly commentary and perspective on some of the biggest issues facing agriculture in rural America, from new ag technology to rural living and raising good kids. Farm Sense takes a common sense approach to tackling real life problems. Go get it at the App Store today. Thanks so much for tuning in today. For David Harker and all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great week in farm country.